So I have the distinct pleasure of kicking off the ontology working group led by Michelle Morris. Uh, we'll see about that. But let me go ahead and share our slides and make sure that folks can see what they need to see. All right. So I think everyone's seeing what we want. All right, ontology working group. Uh, we are going to run through a year in review um, and overview of the Enact Ontology version 4.1, and then a little bit of roadmap and future direction. I just want to say one thing before we invite uh, Michelle up. I think ontologies is like the heart of I2B2, and it is most complicated, and, and Michelle does like just an unbelievable job making, you know, I2B2 what it is. So... <laughs> So a round of applause for her, for her. Now come up here and present this because like amazing work. I mean, it's, it, it, it's a group effort, but you're, but you pull it together. So I will say though, for folks who are gonna ask questions, cause we are gonna ask for some participation, please do use the mics. Don't make me chase you like I had to last year. Where were we? All right, so yeah, we're gonna do a year in review. Uh, overview of version 4.1 of the Enact ontology, and then do a little bit of discussion and sort of roadmap future direction kinds of uh, conversation, I think. So, I want to start out with a mission here. Um, since I joined in with the working group, we worked on the mission of the working group here, and it was around sustainability, advancement, and outreach. So sustainability, ways we can reduce the resources, the burden needed to consume and maintain ontologies for our community. Advancement, uh, making recommendations about uh, supporting community implementations, functionality, interoperability, and usefulness in translational research, and then outreach. So promoting and supporting the I2B2 ontology-based initiatives. And let me go into the next one here. Let me also apologize in advance if we missed anybody in this. We have a large number of participants. Some folks can join every month, some folks can't, uh, but we're glad to have any and all participation. And I guess I'll say, like a kind of an, on a personal note here, I think anyone who's on this Zoom or in this room, you can contribute in these working groups. I don't have a whole string of letters after my name. I'm not an ontologist, I'm not a software developer, I'm not a data scientist. And I feel like I belong in the working group and I feel like I can contribute. People make me feel welcome. So I hope you would also feel welcome joining us in any of the working groups. All right, year in review and Michelle, jump in when you, when and if you want to. All right, so we've had some member led discussions over the months. So an RDF ontology importer for I2B2, talking about some zip code ontology from Griffin, who's in the room here and then some presentations on metadata management. Uh, so that was from Rob at Ochen and also our team Mayo who's represented here. Some further ones, so some LOINC background, LOINC groups and Trinetics lab groups, clinical trials as well. And as you heard yesterday uh, from Mark, Ab Mark Abajian, uh, CEDO, some presentations around that as well. And an I2B2 ontology store, and there'll be a demo of that as well. So that came out of discussions at the ontology work group. We kind of came up with the MVP for what that tool should do. And as a result, Kevin then developed it so that hopefully we can release it and make it easier to consume ontology. All right. Now. Now it's you, Michelle. So give us uh, the <laughs> overview of the ontology. Okay. So I'm going to say that like ontology is okay, but it's not all of I2B2. I2B2, I'm very passionate about it because it is an elegantly designed software ontology in a way the whole ecosystem works together. And it's also a Swiss Army knife that I think enables all of us to do a lot of different things. So I don't mind contributing ontology stuff because I think it's a very worthwhile tool. So it's definitely more you guys than me. So now we're going to go over the act ontology. 
college. I don't mind saying I'm tired of but I keep doing it. Um, the ontology version 4.1 is now, it went from like 16 to 19 different ontology tables. And you can see them here. Um, five of them were totally unchanged because uh, three of them were like ICD-9 based and there hasn't been a change in ICD-9 in a long time. Um, we didn't change uh, vital signs or um, there's one more, I can't think of it right now. Um, we have three new ontologies and then the rest of the ontologies, most of them are UMLS based. I build them from UMLS. Um, so we just upgraded them to version 2022 AB and they have some minor modifications in some of them as well. Uh, uh, the, also, the other thing that I'm kind of proud of for this version of the ontology, we're starting our journey to like a CDM agnostic querying. So the ACT ontology is over I2B2 traditional CDM schema. We have our first version that we'll be launching kind of widely over OMA, and then we'll move on to do it over Bacori as well. So. The basic stuff that's been in the ontology a long time is um, demographics, which is just like race, age, gender, vital status, those types of things. And then we have um, visit details. And the only little tweak I really have is details that is new for this version. Um, I think it was Nick from UCLE requested that we add a column if you want to do it. You don't have to, but if you add a column to the visit dimension table, that is a computed age at visit, there's a version of the ontology that you can install that will take advantage of that co column so that it'll be a faster query instead of the computed version that's in the older versions. We have the two lab ontologies. The provisional one is called that because it has a lot of labs and we don't know to what extent um, people have ETL all their labs into their I2B2. And so we just put that provisional just so you could know, like if your numbers kind of come back wonky, that's probably why. And then we have um, the common labs, which is a much smaller curated set of labs um, that Muller built um, that take the labs that you most use during your research. We have two medication ontologies. One is sorted by ingredient and the other one is sorted by VA class. The real addition except for adding new medications in this one is I added in hick picks underneath um, drugs that like are uh, injection and things like that. So rituximab, you'll, you'll have the ARCS norm, you'll have the NDC and the hick picks, which it does make a difference because in some of the research that I've been working on, I got a lot more of the meds because of the HICS picks instead of it being in the traditional from the traditional medication tables. And then we have, of course, all of our ICD-9, 10, CPT, ICD-10, PPCS. We have a very limited set of social determinants of health. It's just smoking and insurance concepts. And we have also a limited set of vitals. And of course, we have our composed ontology uh, for COVID-19 that has a lot of different stuff in it. Um, COVID tests, COVID vaccinations, um, some course of illness kind of aggregations. And, and then we have our new ontologies. So our new ontologies are mostly because for ACT, we're trying to move from, oh, we're trying to move from uh, just cohort exploration to, you know, towards research. And so we're trying to create some ontologies that might help researchers or um, staff that provision data to give more insight into the cohorts that people query and select. And so I think with these three new um, ontologies, we've added a decent amount of value, um, and it, but it's not going to take a whole lot for sites to uptake it, right? Like, so, so Griffin made a great zip code ontology a vaccination ontology, those two will require some ETL, but for the most part, the research ontology is mostly utilizing existing codes. So I'll kind of go through a little bit. So um, 
Griffin probably could speak to this better, um, but he made a great ontology that takes a lot of different looks at um, geography using zip codes, RUCC codes, HRR, he knows what all this stuff means, I don't. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, but I think it's going to be great because it'll really support people who are doing like social determinants of health or other geographic type um, queries paired with their other cohorts. So, uh, but what he would, I mean, when you use this ontology, you will need to make your zip codes or zip three or whatever level of representation you want to support in this ontology, it needs to become an observation fact um, and not just a fact that's in the uh, patient dimension table. But I think it's going to be powerful for, you know, a lot of different uh, research. Um, the vaccination ontology, I got that from the um, CDC immunization tables, and you only last a little bit, but um, I made a hierarchy of groups by CVX group, and then a CVX code, and then below that you can have like the CPTs or NDC medication levels in that hierarchy. So we thought since we already had the um, COVID vaccines, it might be good just to do the whole domain. And then we have the research ontologies. <clears throat> Sorry, we were out late. Sorry. <laughs> um, so these are mostly just new classification hierarchies. I mean, this is kind of the reason why I like I2B2 because my ontologies are really just light touches, different veils, different perspectives on existing data. And these ontologies, for a large part of them, they are utilizing existing ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. Um, there's a couple that have a little additional stuff in it, but they're mostly just re-envisioning different ways to look at the data within I2B2. So um, we have some subtrees that are, we have the fee code one um, that groups the, the ICD-9s, are ICD-10s and fee codes? Um, yeah, so it has the ICD-9s and ICD-10s for the different fee codes. We have Charleston comorbidity. We have Alex Hauser comorbidity. Um, so all of those are different ways that you can look at the data. And in, I have some pictures later that the other thing that I'm excited about is that for a lot of these, I've created breakdown queries to go with it. So if you do a cohort, you'll be able to do a breakdown with Charleston comorbidity. And so you'll have like a little quick way to make like a quick table one for your data. You know, you're using Charleston or Alex Hauser or some of these other little measures. Um, and I have some pictures of that later. Um, the other one I created is um, an NIH enrollment. Now this does require ETL. So what I was trying to enable here is support for researchers when they're creating grants. This one also will have a breakdown that goes with it, but you do have to do ETL because that triple needs to be computed for each patient. So their race, their um, whether or not they're Hispanic and their gender. And so if you create that triple, you put that fact into your observation fact table, the people at your, you know, all the people who are using your I2B2 will be able to generate their own NIH enrollment table that they can submit with their grant just by um, using the breakdowns. So, uh, so just trying to enable people to be able to do more or through their provisioning teams will be able to use these types of things as well to hopefully move data through the system a little faster. Um, and so here is like my favorite friend breakdowns and I'm going to thank, you know, Mark Denny and Mark and the Shrine team because they were very kind to oblige me and make it so that we can pull breakdown queries all the way through through Shrine. Uh, so now I can configure for Enact a set of breakdown queries that you'll be able to run and, you know, you'll be able to get the output table like you can for the um, demographic breakdown. So by site, you'll be able to see the counts of the ages and races, but you'll also be able to do that for like Charleston or Alex Helzer. Um, we have a couple others like the most frequently, um, the most frequent medications or the most frequent um, diagnosis to the three digit 
ICD level. Uh, I also have some for, I guess I should just click to the pictures. So I, I left the number zero on there. But this is an example of the NIH enrollment one. So it would have numbers, of course, but um, and so it would, you know, basically say, you know, and female, Hispanic, and it would get the count, it would break down your cohort by those numbers. So you'll be able to do characterization and stuff. And this is an image of um, most frequent diagnosis in Shrine. Uh, so basically like your cohort, you'll be able to see like amongst this group, what's the most popular, um, you know, diagnosis that goes with this set of patients. Uh, you'll, so you'll be able to compare, you know, um, Oh God, this loud thing. and proud, Michelle, loud and proud. Uh, uh, the same thing goes for Charleston comorbidity. This is also a picture from Shrine. Um, this is what it'll look like on the ACT network when we implement it, hopefully next month or so. Uh, this is a picture of it from uh, in the traditional I2B2. And this particular one is a breakdown that I created that basically counts the number of patients that have at least one of these types of facts in each of the domains. So as you can see, you know, I have 1900 patients. Um, most of them have a diagnosis, have a visit, have a medication, but only 189 of them have labs in the system. So it'll let you help, you know, make some decisions on whether you want to proceed with this particular cohort. Do you need to expand it so that you can have patients that have more data? Um, and this is uh, most frequent medication ingredients. Uh, yeah, so I had changed this one a little bit from top 20 meds so that it was at the ingredient level because a lot of meds are in the same, they, it was kind of like, oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> and then like, here's an example of um, the, these are a list of common uh, labs, which this I pulled from our COVID ontology we had this list of common labs for COVID. And so I said, I thought, okay, that's a good starting point for um, a lab breakdown. And so it'll break down, you know, like there's 434 patients, you know, almost 300 of them have AOT, you know, almost 300 have albumin, but you know, like only 14 have fiber. So just so that you can, a, a researcher won't have like that one black box number, they'll have some other things that they could analyze to kind of figure out what their patients look like. So the Enact Ontology should be ready for everyone uh, early next month and should still support Oracle, Postgres, DB, and SQL Server. It's going to come in two flavors, I2B2 and OMA. Um, the one that will release with the uh, early October version is going to be based on the OMA vocab version May 2023. And like Sean said, like soon as I finish that, OMA released a new version. And so I'll have to generate a whole other um, ontology that would be compatible with the um, August 2023 version that I just released. And um, so when you're if you're taking up the OMOP one, I want you to be very careful to make sure that your OMOP version in your OMOP data is compatible with the version that of the ACT one, because in OMOP, versioning is very, very important. You will not be harmonized if you mix and match versions. So your codes will be in different places than what I'm expecting them to be and the IDs may diff be different from what I'm expecting them to be. So um, I want everyone to be very careful that they understand that they need to keep their versions in sync with what um, OMOP is when they're taking these ontologies uh, for them to perform well. I mean, you'll get, you know, the queries will work, but the performance will probably be bad if they don't match. So this particular version that I built it on is May, 2023. So I haven't, maybe somebody knows, but I don't really know, like, like, I don't see a version for the whole OMO vocabulary. Like they release like bits and pieces, but some of them, they kind of name them as a version, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but I know that they have one 
from May 2023 that was like a significant version, and then they've released another significant version a couple, you know, a month ago. All of these are all of five, dot three or four. Yeah, like, yeah. And that's, and for me, that hasn't been the bigger issue. It's just the vocab itself is the thing that's a bigger issue for me. Because the, I don't, you know, 5.3 and 5.4 are different little CDM changes, but most of the, the main fields, the fields that I'm dealing with are in both of those, right? So it doesn't matter. Yeah, May and August are the two important. And then those two, I think, are also important because I think what happened was like there was a January one, a May one, and then an August one. And there's some codes that really moved in to different places that you would really be out of sync with if you, depending on which one of those three you had. So, um, like I said, um, we're trying to do CDM agnostic. And this is just a little infographic that kind of shows, you know, OMA. Um, one of them is just the OMA, I mean, the I2B2, you know, with a one to one adapter mapping for those of us using Shrine. And then you know, there's other people who are doing I2B2 and may have multi-fact table that is not OMOP based. So um, we want to be able to support all of them. And uh, I hope we can get there. And then I have a few other little resources that I'm packaging up with it, just stuff that I built on the road to the ontologies. Um, one of the things is a list of like static concept IDs that will be static forever um, to a path. And that's one of the things that I think we're going to be using, like in the um, data quality work, um, just to be able to keep track of specific concepts. I also use this particular, um, these concept IDs to generate transitive closure tables of each of the ontologies, which I've been finding very helpful. Darren from Kentucky had written some great um, transitive closure SQL, so I utilized it to build these tables, but they're, you know, like if you're using stuff in R or um, other type of analysis, these things tend to be helpful because it's basically doing the roll up. And then I have some code that I wrote for N3C that if you have, um, if you've like augmented or extended the ACT ontology and have like your custom codes underneath uh, the, the, so right now, you know, there's ACT leaves, if you have code underneath those, I have some code that will kind of roll those up and map them to what their standard version is. So when you're dealing with um, harmonizing with other people, you can still have all your little local codes, but this will allow you to, when you export the data, it would be mapped to what the, you know, the CPT or the ICD-9 is. Um, and it's just a little bit of SQL, tiny little bit. So the trans. Oh, he said, "What is a transitive closure table?" Now, don't let me say for real what it is. I don't know. Um, it so um, basically, so in I two B two, we rely on the like, right? So like I C D ten one two three. I'm making it up. Um, in the transitive closure table, it will have. ICD-10, 1, 2, 3, but it will also, it'll, as a child, it will have all the children in there, right? So it'll say ICD-1, 2, 3, and then you'll have ICD-1, 2, 3, ICD-1, 2, 3, ICD-1, 2, 3, point 1. IC so it allows you to do a query without using in. You can do the exact query, right? The equals query, where it equals ICD-1, 2, 3, and get all the children of that. Does it make sense? Or was that just like a, you could have did it. You could have told them. <laughs> Example. Okay. Yeah. So, and I guess, I don't, I don't know if Jim Campbell's on here. He's probably like, I told you I wanted to do that. No, but anyway, Jim Campbell wanted to do the transitive closure deal for the longest time. But we were very bad people. Uh, and, um, but, but when you're doing research, it is quite helpful, right? Because in I2B2, it does the work for us. So it does the roll up for us. But when you're just doing stuff like in R or whatever, you kind of need something that doesn't have to figure out, doesn't, can't, 
may not be able to do the, you know, like. It's, you know, it's, it's harder for certain systems to do that. So, so, so that's it for the enact version 4.1 ontology. Anyone have questions? And I, I guess I will make a pitch to use the microphones if you have questions and also to note the fact um, that we have Mark Abajian, who, if, he, if there's any sort of CEDO questions, he had a presentation yesterday. If there's any CEDO questions or anything uh, that he might be able to answer, he can also unmute himself and we will hear him too. But yeah. I guess we're looking for any questions about this version of the ontology, about the working group. And then, Michelle, is there anything that you wanted to get out of this like sort of discussion? Right. So we're going to, I mean, if everyone wants to talk about, like, so here, uh, can you see that? Um, this is kind of the roadmap of what we have. And, um, the columns going across the top kind of say whether it's, you know, an ITV2 ontology, a shrine ontology, or um, an ACTOMA version of the same ontology. And then when we get to Bacori, that column, of course, is empty right now. So we are pretty much at this is like version 4.1, where we have all those things, including the breakdown. Uh, and then the version 2.0 stuff, is that? Yeah, so we need to figure out what our next version is and what does the community think uh, would be the most impactful ontologies for us to start working on. Um, I really like the CEDO stuff that Mark worked on. Um, SDOH is hot, but it's a very tough thing for a site because I think there's so much variability in how sites are collecting SDOH, um, whether or not they're in the system. Like we don't have SDOH in our I2B2 because we don't know where to find the data. Um, and it's very, the standardization of the coding I don't think has really been adopted yet. Um, so I'm leaning towards CEDO because it's gonna be a much more uniform implementation because it like, like the zip code stuff, it's based on something that we don't particularly have to get from um, the EHR, but would still have a lot of power. Um, so I like looking into that area. And then the other thing is like for ENACT, we're working on NLP stuff. So we need to start thinking about how we build, you know, NLP from the stuff we extract from the notes. So how do we build those ontologies and how do we separate the provenance of that data from our EHR data? So we have a lot to think about there. So those are the two areas I'm thinking about, but um, you know, it's open. Maybe there's some low hanging fruit somewhere. Uh, go yeah. ahead, Sean. You have to use a mic, sorry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, Michelle, mm -hmm. it's totally amazing. Totally. Thank you. All right. Stop. It, it, it's just all right. <laughs> now, um, recognizing that I'm not actually on the ontology working groups, I'm not sure I get a vote. No, you're not to talk. Anybody can talk. Anybody, Anybody can talk. Okay. Anybody can tell us what to do. All right. Well. My, my, I guess it's not really a vote then, it's a, something else. Um, document ontology. Right. And the reason that that is really cool is because, um, one, it, it's been hard to nail down everywhere, right? And mm -hmm. there's a lot of unrest about like, you know, even like what's the hierarchy you would use or, you know, how do you even go about that? And so kind of um, putting a, a stake in the ground might be, you know, just where we could you know, just to just to visualize something, you know, mm -hmm. because of it, it, it's just such an ambiguous concept. And 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 um, just to go into that a bit, it's it's about um, just classifying documents, right? So, you know, is it an ambulatory note? Is it an inpatient note? Is it a discharge summary? You know, is it a pathology note? You know, and it, at first it seems really easy, you know, because it's like, well, of course, but then two things. One is, um, then when you get into the details, it actually turns out it's kind of hard. But number two, and then if you're from two different, you know, if one person's from one place and one person's from another place, they'll have a totally different obvious ontology. Okay. So um, now the reason it's really important, though, 
is because if we're going to go and be doing a lot of stuff with notes like NLP or like large language models, we're going to need to get subsets of notes because, you know, usually, you know, you got to constrain your problem, whatever it is, and say, okay, I'm only going to do this on ambulatory notes. Or I'm only going to do it on discharge summaries or something like that. Like Emily Albanzer, yes, that I showed yesterday, she only did it on discharge summaries. And so she, the first, her first problem was, okay, how do I just get discharge summaries, right? And, but the, um, so, so, you know, it becomes a very uh, important practical problem from, yeah. from that point of view. Yeah. And actually, we were going to work a little bit on it. Um, I think it's this young lady from um, Russ's team is going to help a bit. Um, they've been looking into that a lot, too. So we were going to try to leverage the work that they were doing for, like, the Enact Ontology to start that. I, I know Vivian bit. and I tried for a little while, but then we kind of gave up. I could give an update on that a little bit um, from our side. So we use Picornet CDM, and um, we started in including the notes metadata information in our ops clin table. That's the uh, clinical observation table. And we built an ontology based on, um, it, it was from the loing.org website. So they have a hierarchy for all those loing part numbers. So we built that on I2B2, like Saber worked on it. So now we are at a point where we are mapping that data from our ops clean table to that ontology in I2B2. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah if so, any site is interested yeah. in collaborating with that. Yeah, so if you could bring that to like ontology work group, we could kind of look through it and see how hard it is for the other sites to mm -hmm. do yeah. it. Yeah, so mean, we can join um, the ontology work group to yeah. discuss cool. this. Thank you. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah, I have a, a question that um, might be obvious for, for most here, but I haven't worked much with the ontologies. I saw you had uh, different comorbidity ontologies from one type and another one, uh, and that happens throughout uh, in, in different um, uh, areas. If you want to run a query that gets all the patients with comorbidities, but across different sub ontologies, how do you do that? So you had a comorbidity, you, you had a name on it, and then there was another. Yeah, so that's so, the other thing you can use it for. So like, you can almost use it like a fee code, right? A, a, a Charleston one, you could say, give me all the patients that have CHD and, or CHF or something. And you just put that in a panel. And if you want to do it across, you would say, give me all the people with CHF from um, Charleston. If that's another, if that's another comorbidity that's in Alex Hauser, you can put them all in the same okay, panel so, or across panels. So right? you need to know how they map in order no, to query them. Or is... That's the nice thing about it is under if you open up. Oh, this isn't live. If you open up those ontologies, you will see all the ICDs that make up that category. Okay. So those ICDs are already in your system, right? Mm -hmm. It's just grouping them different ways. Okay. Thank you. I'll, yeah. I'll talk to you after. Thank you. Uh-huh. Griffin. Thank you. Um, I want to make a couple comments. Um, first, uh, again, I'm back on the transitive closure part. Um, in I2B2, we're normally dragging over a single ontology item, and it's expanding on that, and it works fine. Mm -hmm. It's the problem when you're trying to leverage a large number of concepts and join those in queries. And with the size of the ACT ontology, it doesn't even work, the queries, if you're trying to do a big join on the like. So it, we're incorporating the computational phenotype pipeline. We have that big transitive closure part and what we were doing in 4C. It's kind of needed everywhere if you're doing things in bulk. Mm. And related to performance, we added the zip code ontology. And it's big because there's a bunch of different metadata about zip codes, the um, three-digit roll-up, the um, uh, different kind of geographic hospital groupings that we put in there. And it's all captured right now in the hierarchy. But as we added the CEDO and other stuff, there's all this metadata about zip codes that we're incorporating either into the ontology or as new facts that aren't very efficient. And we may need to eventually have something like a zip code dimension where mm -hmm. we have all that information about the zip codes and it just joins to the patient dimension on the zip code field. Mm -hmm. So this isn't necessarily a new additional item to add into the ontology, but thinking about implementation of the ontology, right. I really like that um, new column in the visit dimension, the age at visit, and thinking about how we would implement zip codes or other geographic groupings if we want to really expand that out to lots of, right. um, lots of and items. And I think when we 
like look at that it should be kind of holistic because like for Yan Chan, like i said for like nlp maybe a dimension is the way that we tackle that but i don't know it might put some work on mike who might have to do some like underlying work like I'm, so I'm that, not sure it needs changes to ITB2. It's sort of being think think be creative okay. in the ontology with SQL by joining. You, know, you can define a um, ontology item where mm -hmm. instead of the modifier table, you're joining to a zip code mm -hmm. table and the join column is like zip code CD in the patient dimension. So right. I, I think we can figure out with some SQL defined ontologies with lookup tables and do the, the same thing without requiring that would still be able to changes to the query take advantage anything. of the hierarchy stuff yeah so okay so this is what i'm saying we, I just think, have to I think we want to explore a little bit about um implementation of the ontology in addition to the concepts we want to put okay in. cool i mean i'm willing to learn i have another one because i also have some other stuff that i wanted to like hard code values to but i haven't quite fit actually i realized that i left a little test case in the ontology on accident but i just haven't quite figured out how to get it to work so like if you know how i will definitely be interested in that okay thank cool. you hi yeah. hi uh just all want to comment on the document uh the note type thing and you know maybe give some updates on the NAC nlp working group so because right now I'm leading the ANAC NLP working group, and uh, we actually just started in late July. So we have uh, 10 ANAC sites, and I don't uh, think you're talking most into the mic. ANAC sites. Yeah. yeah, I don't okay. think you're talking into uh, it. Yeah, most ANAC sites have, when we did, uh, build this working group, we kind of select ANAC sites that already have some NLP expertise. Uh, but when once we meet together, we realize uh, actually the problem is uh, uh, way more complicated than we thought. So some sites, uh, yeah, speak about the uh, note type. Some sites, all the notes, they are just uh, uh, putting together in one uh, gigantic document for one patient. And some note, some sites, they have very specific sections. And some side they have, you know, different documents have different note type with the header, uh, you know, meaning those uh, different note, you know, the meaning for the note. So it's really for the note type, we were thinking about the long uh, document uh, note type, but it is just um, more complicated for the size to develop, to adopt one unified solution to um, basically uh, uh, index their note. Uh, based on those notes type and uh, there might be we, we were talking about some classification problem uh, classification uh, and a model to classify maybe some sections or um, some some note specific in a document to one of the note type but it's uh, just a really site dependent problem uh, and we to solve that problem our working group kind of break into several focus groups because it's just uh, so difficult to have a unified solution for every site. So we have a six or seven focus group uh, and focus on different uh, um, phenotyping algorithms. And NLP is also cohort dependent. So let's, speak, let's talk about, for example, the SDH. So different cohort may have a different SDH, right? So uh, for uh, patients with a disability, transportation problem may be is documented in the clinical note. But for another cohort of patients with, uh, let's say, diabetes, maybe transportation is not well documented in the clinical notes. So uh, we have to define, for every focus group, for every phenotype, we have to define uh, the cohort first, and then try to figure out whether the SDH is, is documented in for those cohort. And every site is also different. So UPMC may have a, for the patient with a disability, maybe they document uh, transportation well. But for another side, maybe the physician just you know, don't document that. So uh, that's why we try to figure out a way to uh, work on the SUH uh, as well. Uh, but uh, it is really more complicated than we thought. Another second uh, thing is the ontology, just uh, as Michelle mentioned, we. Originally, we are thinking maybe we can develop an uh, ontology that we extract all the maybe concepts from the note, and uh, later we figure out that's not realistic. Uh, because of NLP is a, 
uh, cohort dependent, is node type dependent, uh, and uh, you cannot just think about it, grab a LLM and you're hoping it could extract all the concepts. Not every site has a GPU to, to run those LLM. Not every site has a, uh, access to, you know, OpenAI or Azure. So it's really, we have to consider some low resource uh, tools for the sites to run NLP. So those are some practical problems we are facing and <laughs> we try to solve in the future. Yeah. Wow. Okay, cool. so first, amen to that. You can't just <laughs> do everything and expect it to work, right? That just isn't going to happen. And, so we re and we have to pay a lot of attention to that so that we don't end up assuming something weird like that and then you know, be like, well, that's not going to work. So yeah, so focusing on how do we do focused NLP, make it work on hardware or, or resources, I guess I would say, that hospitals actually have you know, available and, and so forth is a really important part of this, of this problem, I think. And then I had a little anecdote. So um, it's like, well, you know, why wouldn't notes be classified, you know, in a reasonable way? Because, you know, I mean, they're kind of the same everywhere and it seems like they should be. But actually, um, their classification was actually usually done by the lab system. Because, you know, lab systems early on, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s were all about you know, sending labs around, right? And then, and, and they would use this new thing, HL7. And then, you know, HL7 started to be used for more stuff. And so, but it got kind of assigned to, and then notes started to fly around in HL7, but then it's, it was like, well, but we have to do it, you know, with the lab team, you know, figuring it out. So that, it just became like chaos. And I don't think it's ever recovered um, from that. So, so we do have a big problem on our hands, but yeah. it will be well worth, I think. Yeah. Anybody else? Would you want to switch back to the slide of the uh, the things that might be in 4.2? I guess uh, I'm curious if anybody has any comments on what might be. So they already most... picked note. Uh, yeah. You know, note document on top. Let's see where is that at? Oh, there it is. There we go. Is it tiny? Yeah. What might be most impactful, I guess, and most valuable? Right. So I know like at my site, like we're doing some genetic ones. So I'm building some gene type ontologies. I have like a request for, oh, I have a request. Well, I can't see it. Well, can <laughs> um, no, no, that's my mint. That's sorry. I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, um, I have some requests for HPO. Uh, I'm not sure like, does anybody know like who puts HPO into the EHR? Like, how does it get in there, those HPO IDs? So, but I have requests for that one, but I don't know how I would link it to um, my data. Oh. It does, uh-oh. Time won't give me. <laughs> we have a song going. Um, but does anyone else have anything that they think should bubble to the top for the next version? Oh, I think Hossein wants CCSR and CCS as the procedure classifications. And does anyone know a really good procedure classification hierarchy? Because I, I think we're hurting in that area, in general. Oh. Anything else? Any choices up here? Any votes? No. Yeah. So um, when Mike was saying, like, a lot of our um, join the working group, but one of the things that we have like spent a lot of time in the working group, I will say, is LOINC. Like we cannot crack that nut to save our lives to get a LOINC ontology that is user friendly and understands that at every site somebody's using a different LOINC for albumin or you know glucose or whatever. So I think it's challenging because some of the links get put on at the lab and, you know, they know the specific machine and method and all that stuff, but some of the links are being mapped by like our teams or other teams and they look at the list and they're like, oh, this is close enough. And so they put that link on it and it comes flying through to the EHR and to us and what it has. So, but the thing is that you have to harmonize that too. 
you know, kind of like, not to one thing, but just so that you know how to group them all together and make sure that they are the same kind, say in the same category. And uh, some of the links, depending on your institution. You're not talking in a mic. And some of the links, uh, <laughs> depending on your institution, uh, may have been assigned by people with neither set of training. And they me. just, and <laughs> well, no, uh, sometimes it's not informatics and it's not the lab. It's it was someone in IT place. that just had to do it for meaningful use. And so we found a whole lot of them when, when I was at the University of Illinois that were just miscoded. And pathology had no idea how they came up with these crazy things, but someone did a little bit of you know, character recognition and they said, oh, that looks like that's what that code Close is. Enough. Mr. Mukti, come on over to the mic for here. Come take my mic. I wanted to follow the previous comment. So it is indeed the case we find many miscoded loink, uh, miscoded lab results to loink. And as a vendor, we find ourselves in a very interesting situation. We actually go back to the hospital and we say, here's a spreadsheet where, you know, you assign the loink code here that, that, that's like expecting yes or no, but it's actually a numeric value with units or you know hemoglobin a1c you grabbed the concentration you really meant the percent of total and all of these inconsistencies and the hospital looks at us and basically says who the heck are you <laughs> no we're not going to change our loings it's, it's as you said they're in meaningful use reporting um and and therein lies a problem right you kind of institutionalize them and it's difficult to break. So guys, as you go through these exercises, keep an open mind. The mapping is not perfect. Try to, try to sort of keep that in mind and uh, consider the possibility that the fix is necessary. So that, I mean, that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time. I think he's gonna um, let Andrea be able to talk because she's one of the people that's been leading us um, in that discussion, and she knows a lot in that space. Andrea, can you hear me? Yeah, Andrea, can, if you can unmute, can you, um, yes. can you hear me? be able to unmute and speak? Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me? I put you on the spot with this, but. Yeah, so she put a few questions into the chat. Andrea, this is Mark. I can hear you on Zoom. Yeah, Andrea, we can't hear you. No, we can't hear you. Or at least not yet. But give us a moment. We'll we'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. We're looking at your uh, what you put into the Q and A, but wanted to dig into it a bit deeper. Sure. Ooh, all right, Andrea, we could hear you there. Yeah. So um, one of the challenges um, in EHR design. So if you have an EHR that um, such as a typical non-academic medical center physician practice and they are interfaced from one to five different laboratories. Um, for something like the albumin example, and I presented at the LOINC meeting last year and Matt V and I are both um, scheduled to present this year here in another month um, in, in case folks are interested. The issue is often the EHR will build a single albumin. It will not list the method and if there's more than one different method coming in from those performing laboratories, and they may have LOINC encoded it specific to their method, brum Cresol green, brum Cresol purple, whatever the case might be, those are remapped to the EHR single albumin, and often they are mapping to a single generic LOINC code. So you're losing the specificity and the clinically significant differences between those methods then it's not the only test. I mean, EGFRs, there's a whole bunch of them um, that have numeric results. Not, all, not every lab test, but there's a number. Um, this is a challenge for real world data and evidence because when you're trying to tap into the EHR as your data source, um, you've already lost information. And so that's gonna get perpetuated to the research and clinical or the research and other studies and biases, et cetera. So, it's a challenge. There's also several initiatives going on 
um, nationally. Um, we talk about the LOINC issues. If people have challenges or questions, feel free to reach out. I'm in the lab LOINC committee as well. Matt V also has um, expertise as he's been finding with his you know, customers and things. The other thing is from a LOINC perspective um, or a, a lab perspective, there's an initiative called SHIELD, um, which is convened by FDA, C uh, CDC, ONC, and others that are working on this from a clinical perspective, but also to get real world data and evidence because FDA during the pandemic had challenges. You know, if you're looking to see um, assessments, do the vaccines or any of the test kits have issues from a surveillance perspective? Are there things like diabetes being um, uh, occurring as a result from a, the COVID pandemic, et cetera. And so they've been challenged in getting this data out of the EHR and having it have accurate meaning. Um, so SHIELD is working on um, making sure that the lab test retains the meaning, um, the exact meaning every time, every place, where whichever information system it's in. Um, this is gonna be a, a long-term project um, it's not going to happen overnight, but um, as Michelle's um, mentioned, uh, LOINC does not, it's not designed to be hierarchical. <laughs> um, and so you can do value sets, like show me all the different albumin LOINC codes um, for the different methods, but it, it doesn't have the parent-child relationship like SNOMED does, because you might have one portion of a LOINC code, say specimen, that's more um, broad, it can be a variety of different specimens for how some tests are designed, or it can be more specific when you look at the method um, of a test or, you know, units or whatever the case might be. There there could be the same curve could be more broad in one um, aspect and um, less broad or more specific in another. So it's really hard. How are you going to group things if you're looking at a hierarchy? Is it by specimen? Is it by units? both. <laughs> so it it's part of the challenge in working with it um, in lab tests in general. It's not necessarily a, a LOINC specific issue, but just lab tests in general. Um, if it's something to looking at qualitative or other types of things, um, some of the, the aspects don't apply as much, but um, it, it's a challenge. And let me know if that answers your questions or if other questions arise in the room. Yeah, I mean, so we're lucky we have both Matsi and Andrea to try to help us do this. And maybe we can get uh, Amy and the usability um, sphere to kind of help us to design something that researchers will be able to understand. Because right now, like I said, we have two lab ontologies. The small one is manageable, but the bigger one, it, it's very hard to navigate and it, the categories, the classification probably isn't very useful. So, um, anything else? What can I say? You just have a comment that your work is amazing. Oh, so. um, any other questions in the room or any other comments about what might come next in 4.2, higher priorities, thoughts, feelings? Huh? No? Well, I will say, uh, I'll sort of echo a bit of what Diane said as somebody who is not an ontologist, not a data scientist, not a you know developer. I, I can see the importance of ontology because it so strongly influences the kind of research questions you can ask, how you can formulate them, the way you might get an answer back. So I have an appreciation, a newfound appreciation for ontology and its complexities, thanks to the work group. So it is important. All right. All right. We'll wrap up. Thank you, Michelle. That's it.